The fourth Sunday of Advent is love. Now, often I'll ask people to sum up some other person in a single word. <laughs> right? That's usually pretty hard to do, to find the right word to summarize that other person. But if I were to ask you to summarize the word love on our Advent of love, I would ask you to sum up, sum up the word love in one other word. What might it be? And I think I would say, Jesus. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I remember that from a child. How, how many here remember that? All right. Yeah. Some of you probably are teaching it to your kids or grandkids or great-grandkids. Maybe even great-great-grandkids, I don't know. But uh, that is a great song. Advent this week, we're focusing on love. And so I want to talk about, first of all, God's love is among us. Among us. And I have for a text on that, 1 John 4, 9. We already covered the whole book of 1 John uh, for the fall sermon series. And... uh, You might remember some of this. This is how God showed his love among us. His love was among us. And this is what he says. He sent his one and only son into the world. You see that word one and only immediately. You got to think of John 3.16. Amen? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is the love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, I have an unusual picture up there for the atoning sacrifice. But if you were with us uh, for uh, 1 John, you know that that is the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments that the people of God had broken. And God, He would dwell among, uh, above that, the lid on that box in a fulgence of glory, a light that radiated between the two cherubim whose wings arched over it. God manifested His glory there and the lid was made of solid gold. So you take that lid off, and inside would be the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded in the pot of manna, but, but the law. And here's the deal. Most of us, in fact, everybody, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We broke the commands of God, and a God who is holy looks on his law, looks at us, and sees, you have broken my law, the wages of breaking the law called sin is death. You should die. So once a year, the high priest would go into the most holy chamber where that box was with the lid, and the lid was called the mercy seat. In Greek, it's called the propitiation. That's the exact same word used here, atoning sacrifice. The lid is the atoning sacrifice. Because the priest would go in and he would sprinkle blood on that lid, and God who was above it would see the blood that covered all the sins of the people who had broke his law. It would make a covering, but it would be a propitiation in the sense that it satisfied a righteous, holy God for one year until Messiah would come. Every year they repeated it, they repeated it, they repeated it. But when the Messiah would come, He would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world once and for all. Wow. God's love was among us for a specific purpose so that God sent His Son to be the propitiation to shed His blood so that we might have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Wow. Christmas is awesome. That lid is the propitiation just as Jesus is our propitiation. Now, God's love is also not only among us, but God's love is before us, before us. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4, it says, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared. You see, He appeared. He was among us. He he was before us. It says He appeared that He saved us. 
Well, we talked about saving last week with throwing out the ring, and I told you how I was uh, on duty as lifeguard, and I jumped in and rescued that little girl. And in order to be a savior, you have to actually save the person. If you fail in saving them, as, as great as your attempt may have been, you are not the savior. A savior saves the people from something. In Christ's case, they named him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He was there before us. Now, watch what the text says. It's not because of righteous things that we have done. This is the number one problem in sharing your faith with people. People believe they are saved for doing good things. And the reason they think you're saved is because you're a good person. And you go to church. And you worship God. You talk about Jesus. All those are good things. You give your offering. You're just kind to everybody. You're smiley and you're pleasant. Man, your good must outweigh your bad. But the Bible says it's not because of righteous things we had done. In fact, those of us who know our Bibles, we know in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, it says there is none righteous, no, not one. Wow. So he's saying, listen, if you've got that notion that the lifeline is extended to you because you're doing good things, you're a good person, you got it all wrong because it's not because of righteous things that we have done that he throws the lifeline Jesus Christ to us, but he says it's because of his mercy. Mercy and grace are like two Different sides of the same coin. Mercy means that God does not give us the judgment we do deserve. He withholds it. On the other side, grace, God gives us forgiveness and eternal life that we do not deserve. Wow. He throws us the lifeline saying, you do not deserve this, but I love you and I'm going to bear your sin. I value you. <clears throat> he values us. I mean, come on, we're, in a real sense, we're worthless, but worth is always something attributed to something. I used to have in my garage a bucket of rusty old bolts. Now, if you were to clean my garage, you would have thrown them out, and then I would have wrung your neck. Because <laughs> those bolts, to you, were worthless. But to me, they were valuable, because those were all the bolts I took out of the fenders of my 1926 Chevrolet as I was restoring it, and I'd restore every part, and then I'd put it right back in, and you would have thrown away the original part, and I would have been really upset. You see... God places a worth on us, even while we're sinners. God sees us as valuable. So much so that he sends his son to die for us, to be the propitiation. He doesn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. He says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you what you do not deserve. I'm going to give you my love, my pardon, my forgiveness, eternal life. This is the kind of love that is before us as we come to Advent love. He says what happens is he saves us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, an old man, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born and Jesus says, no, it's not that. That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And what he is saying here is God saves us through a work of the Holy Spirit. He, he does what we cannot do. He scrubs and cleans us with righteousness. With righteousness. So that I stand before God in Jesus Christ declared to be righteous in him. This is Advent love. So it's among us, <clears throat> it's before us, and God's Advent love is truly beyond us. It is beyond us. It's unimaginable. Listen, in Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul is praying, and he says, I pray that you, 
being rooted and established in love. Paul's praying for the Ephesians. I want you to be rooted, grounded, and established, firm in the love of God. He says that you may have power to grasp the love of Christ. He wants you to know, Jesus loves me, this I know. That's what he wants. That's what he's praying. He's praying that you'll know. Now, now watch what he says. I want you to know how wide the love of God is. How wide. I mean, it, it, it's going in all directions here, but how wide the love of God is. And he wants you to know how long the love of God is, the love of Christ here. And he says, and how high the love of Christ is. And then he says, and how deep the love of Christ is. It's all about the love of Christ. What he's saying here is that Jesus loves me. It's all surpassing. It's all surpassing. We put limits on everything. I see this in our culture everywhere. A couple get together to be married, and they promise each other's love but just in case they got a little prenup over on the side that this doesn't work out, then we're going to know exactly how to split all the assets because I am not so sure. I kind of have, I love you, I love you not. I love you, I love you not. Whoa, that's a sad kind of love. You see, we, we, we're, we're brought up in a culture where love has limits, but God's love has no limits. Man, when I was eight years old and asked Jesus to come into my heart because he loved me and I have messed up so many times in my life and he still loves me. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. When I was eight years old, you know how I got saved? They were preaching on hellfire and damnation. Now, anybody here want to go to hell? Uh, no hands go up, right? I didn't want to go to hell, so I accept Jesus. He was my insurance policy of not burning, okay? Once I really, I mean, I did, I really accept Jesus as my Savior. I mean, I was, it was a fear, the fear of the Lord's beginning of all knowledge. But then as I began to grow in my faith, I realized, oh my goodness, it's not about the fear of the Lord. It's all about the love of Jesus Christ for me. Jesus loves me. This I no. Now, someone has noticed that, that that omnidirectional love of God can be superimposed on John 3.16. Can I see a hand, show of hands? How many here have memorized John 3.16? You know that. You know that by heart. Oh, good. So I'm preaching to the choir here. Okay. Watch what it says. For God so loved the world. That's how deep he went. He went so deep, he left heaven, the glories of heaven, and became made in the likeness of sinful man. He was not sinful, so he was in the likeness of sinful man. The Word became flesh. He became one of us. That's how low he went. Because the Bible says, God demonstrated his love toward us and while we were sinners. Not when I was lovely and awesome and great, because I wasn't, but because he loved me even in my most wretched state. I want you to think about your most wretched state, and I want to tell you right now, God loved you. That's the way it works. God so loved something so vile and despicable as the world that he gave his only son. That is the length to which he would go. He didn't send an angel. He sent his son not any son, the very unique son who is God of God as the Father is God and the Spirit is God. He sent his son so that when, when he go, comes to the earth and he dies on the cross in the book of Acts, it even says God shed his blood for us. Oh my goodness. He is so united in that nature that God, that's the link that he would go, that he would experience having our sin put on him, for he was made to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That, that is the length to which he would go. 
And here's how wide it is. That whoever believes in him. A few years ago, some of you were at the Christmas Eve service and, and um, I had a big box on the stage and I gave everybody little, little gifts. But I, I had a box, one spe- special box. <clears throat> and I brought it out and I said, this is for someone here. And it's got their name on it. And I read it. Whosoever. And then I said, will whosoever come and get it? And you all just sat in your seats. I said, well, whosoever, come and get it. A person started to get up and then looked around. Nobody else is getting up. See how peer pressure works. And they dropped back down in their seat. And then somebody finally got it. They come walking up. So they start walking up. Then someone came running up. Snatched that gift. Why? Anybody could have had it. Because it's whosoever. That's how wide it is. The offer is to everyone. Everyone who will, will make that commitment to Jesus to be Savior and Lord. Listen, this is what it says. This is how high it is. Shall not perish, but have eternal life, the life that God has. Man, isn't this great, the way this works? The omnidirectional love of God. Now tell the, the grandkids, I love you this much. And the kids say to me, well, I love you to the moon and back. (laughs) Oh, boy. This just escalates. You know where it goes? I'm telling you right now, no one can love you more than God loves you. God's love is beyond our comprehension. That's God's love. God's love. Here's a great thing. (laughs) When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, God's love is in you. It's in you. That's what it says in Romans chapter 5. God pours His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. I didn't even feel it. I was eight years old. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And boom, somehow God opened up my heart and poured in His love. It's been there ever since. I received the Holy Spirit and the love of God. It's inside of me. I didn't even know He put it in there, but it's in there. And if you know Jesus, it's in you too. We just have to get it out. That's why it says uh, the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Why? He put it in there. I can love him. Love my neighbor as myself. Why is he telling me to do that? Because he put it in there. I can do this. I can love the Lord. Why? He put it in there. He's not asking me to do anything I can't do. This is Advent love. You can love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you just keep going. And you can love your neighbor as yourself. You can do this because he's put it in you. He's put it in you. Here's my last one, I think. As I click, I'll find out if it's the last one or not. God's love is for us. God's love is for us. I know that from the Bible. In Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us, for us, in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We mess up and we think, oh, God must not love me. I'm sure he's a little disappointed when we mess up. But he still loves us. He loves us. He loves us. This is powerful. Same chapter, you jump down quite a few verses, you come to chapter... Uh, 8 verse 31. What then shall we say in response to, to this? If God is, there it is, for us, he reached down and he pulled me out of my sin and saved me, made me a whole new person in Christ. Who can charge anything against us? Well, they're out there making their charge, but will the charge stand? That's the whole thing. People say, you're just too religious. You're one of those Bible thumpers. You believe in that old-fashioned stuff. And they try to ignore the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Who, who can be against it? I'm telling you, they might temporarily, but in the end, I know we win. I know we win. We win. Watch what it says. 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Wow. Verse 32, I'm going to jump down. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? There's trouble on that screen. You see trouble? That's trouble. I got this car was more trouble than any car I ever had. Anybody had a car with trouble? Yeah. I, I, it, it's winter time. We'd come up to Michigan, celebrate Christmas with my parents, with my kids. Well, as we go back, my folks said, "Well, why don't we come back and spend a couple of days with you?" And so, and it's freezing cold out. It's like the coldest year I could ever remember. It's 20 below zero on our way down. So I get to the house, and as uh, um, we're getting everything in, and uh, we, we, we were chatting for a little while, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, you know, I think maybe I better check my antifreeze if it's 20 below zero. So this is what I think I ought to do. I ought to go out. I, I got a, a, an antifreeze tester in the back of the, my 1974 Hornet Sportabout that was already an antique when I had it, okay? I, I, I got this. I got this antifreeze tester, and we'll just go out. So I go out, put the key in, my dad's with me, we're all bundled up, and I go to open the lid, and it won't come. Ugh! I said, I know what's going on here. It's frozen. The seal, the rubber seal is frozen to the... So I said, you turn the key, I put my foot on the bumper, and I gave that hatch, that back hatch, a jerk, and I ripped it right off its hinges. Aluminum hinges. Now, aluminum hinges do not work very well in extreme cold. I'm standing there, and I said to my dad, I said, I'm sure glad you're here because nobody's going to believe I ripped this hatch right off the back of my car. <laughs> well, now i got to drive around in below zero weather with no back hatch until I get to the junkyard and replace the... So I'm in the bank with this car. You, you, you've had trouble, right? You've, I'm in the bank with the car. My son's with me. He's, oh, he's maybe five or six. He's not in school yet, so he's at the bank with me. And there's an announcement on the speaker while I'm doing my transaction. There's a station wagon in the parking lot on fire. And <laughs> my son pulls my pants and says, Dad, Dad, we have a station wagon. I said, no, no, it's a sport about. <laughs> oh, come on, you guys know where this is going. I finish my transaction. I go out into the parking lot. Billows and billows of smoke are pouring out from underneath the hood in my car. So I jump in, I hit the hood release, it pops open, and I go out and I look, and one of the hoses had broken and it had a metal uh, vacuum line that went across the alternator and shortened everything out, and all the rubber wires, all the rubber was burning and melting off, and all this smoke. I just moved that off, it stopped, and now I got a problem. All the wires are bare. So I go over, to the, uh, go over to the hardware store and get a roll of black electrician tape. I wrap them all up, hop in, start up the car, drive away. <laughs> Talking about troubles, right? Same car next summer. I drive to church, I notice pff, the thing is overheated. So I said, okay, I'll just add a little water to it. So I pop the hood. It doesn't pop. I go, and I'm pulling on it. It's not popping. Go back in, put the release. I can't get this thing up. I can't get it up. I said, okay, it'll be that way. So I go in. I do my little bit of work, and I've got to go home for lunch. So I decide, okay, I'll hop in the car. It's cooled off. By now I can get home. I'll get some tools out, and I'm going to get that thing open. So I'm driving along, <clears throat> and you've got to realize, the road is kind of like Hiller. Two lanes, two lanes. And it gets up to like 60 miles an hour. We're out in the country. I got a country church. And we go down this big dip, and I hit the bottom of the dip, and all of a sudden, boom! <laughs> the hood pops open! Are you kidding me? I can't see. I put it on the brakes. I'm slowing down. I get over on the side gravel. Oh, this car is trouble. I get out of the car. I go around to the front, and I try to get the hood down. Um, finally, I get it down, but I can't get it to latch. So here I am, outside. <laughs> jumping up and down on the hood of my car, and I finally get it to latch. Whew. 
So I get back into the car and I go home. I get home, I try to open it, it won't open. I said, you know what, I'm going to have lunch, I'll come out, I'll throw some tools in the car, and I'll drive it to church, because I had an appointment, I couldn't miss my appointment. So I throw, throw some tools in the car, get an old milk plastic jug so I, with water, when, it, when I get that thing open, I'll pour that in. <clears throat> so I'm on my way to church. I come to that very same place, and boom, it happens all over again. That thing, now, it happened on one side, I'm on the other side, exact same spot. I have to pull over on the gravel. <clears throat> I get out, and of course, here I am, pushing that lid back down, and it won't shut again now. And so there I go, same routine, same day as I'm just jumping up and down on the hood of that car, and finally I get it in. I go ahead and I get in the car, I drive to my appointment. One thing, a little detail I forgot to tell you. When I was at home for lunch, I went into my first wife, and she was at home, and I said, had my lunch ready for me, and I said, I'll tell you what, if I owned a gun, I'd go out there and shoot that car. <laughs> trouble. Hey, listen, life is full of trouble. And you go through trouble, and the first thing that pops in your mind is, what did I do wrong, Lord? Why doesn't God love me? Here I'm driving a 1974 AMC Hornet Sportabout, and my neighbor, man, he's got this really nice, well, he's a dealer. He's, he's, got, he's always selling and trading cars. And he's got a Cadillac, or he's got a Mercedes, and here I am. And this, God, you don't love me. No, that's not true. I don't care what the trouble is in your life. God loves you. How about hardship? Sometimes life is just difficult. It's not some trouble. It, it, life is just hard. It's difficult. It, it might be the hardship of health. Man, I am going through a stretch. This year I've gone through a stretch. Knee, I've never had surgery in my life. I had a surgery on my knee. Then my tooth, my tooth went bad. Oh my goodness, it's just like hardship of health. It could be even worse. Listen, you know what hardship is. It could be a money a hardship on money, you lose your job, you lose your position, uh, you didn't get a bonus, but you were counting on it, and you got, you, got a, you got hardship in life. Maybe it's people. You, you've got a, a person at work, a neighbor, somebody is like, man, I just hate to even see them coming because I know they're just going to make my life miserable. Hardship, hardship. Maybe it's anxiety that you're so worried inside. you got this anxiety. It's hardship. Things in life are tough. Listen, does any of this hardship separate me from the love of God? Absolutely not. God still loves me. God still loves me. Persecution. Thank God I haven't had to go through this. I've had minor people being a little bit against me, but I've never faced, like the early Christians, persecution. He said, listen, can you imagine being persecuted, your life on the line, and you're thinking, God, if you love me, why are you letting this happen to me? Even persecution, God still loves you. How about famine or sickness? I have never experienced this either. God still loves you. Danger of sword. I haven't had that one either. I came close to it once. It wasn't a sword, it was a gun. I was on a visit and the guy didn't like me. And I was telling him how, you know, I have no fear because I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. He jumped up out of his seat, ran in. He was halfway in the room and he reached out like this. I couldn't see the arm because he's in the doorway. And he said, okay, now, if I grab my gun on the desk here, or the dresser, whatever he said, and he said, and I would then take it out and point it at you, you wouldn't be afraid? I said, oh. <laughs> I said, I'd be afraid, I just wouldn't have any fear. <laughs> I said, fear is, you know, fear is where you just can't go on because, you know, you're just so, you're so fearful. But God has taken away my fear. I would be very scared, and I would be worried. I said, but... I would not be afraid. I, the die is going to be of Christ. Hey, listen, that's his, he didn't even have one there. He just put it, just scared me, right? Just scared me. I, I've never had that either. But even if I did, God still loves me. Is this amazing? Wow. Now, I'm not going to go through detail on all these. Let's just read them. For, they're two extreme opposites. Neither death nor life, 
neither angels nor demons, neither the present, that is today, nor next week, (laughs) nothing, listen, listen, nor any power, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all of God's creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is Advent love, folks. This is what we're celebrating. When we get together Saturday on Christmas, we are celebrating God sent this love into the world. Amen? I just think this is glorious. Here. This is what I want you to do in closing. I want you to bask in God's Advent love. I mean, for this week, this this is a big week. We're going to light the last Advent candle on Christmas Eve. I want you to bask in God's love, that God's love is for us. God's love is for me. I want you to say that. God's love is for me. God's love is in me. God's love is beyond me. I just don't comprehend this. I don't love like this. My love is too conditional, and I know it. God's love is unconditional. Listen, God's love is before us. Open up the scriptures. It's right there before you. Read in Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 2, John chapter 1. Read that Advent story. It's right there before you. God's love is among us. You know why? Because he's put it right down inside of us so that we have it to share. What I'm trying to talk about here, Advent love. This, what I've been talking about, is Advent love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that there is nothing can change the love of God that is for us, that's in us, even though it's beyond us. It's been among us, uh, Lord, and, and we have it in the scriptures. We just need to go there and hear you tell us how much you love us. So in this Advent season, Lord, help us share that love. May we wear a smile on our face and uh, look to someone in need and help them and do it for the love of Jesus that's inside of us. Oh, Lord, help us, oh God, to be very mindful that you loved us so much, so, so much, that you sent your only begotten Son into the world for us. And this I pray in Jesus' name, amen.